welcome to our side event on eliminating gender-based violence through multi-stakeholder action. We are so excited that you are here today with us for this very important conversation. My name is Sarah Hendricks and I am the director of the Policy Program and Intergovernmental Division at UN Women. And we're here for an important conversation. We're here to look at gender-based violence, its pervasiveness, the significance of it as a human rights violation, but also we're here to look at solutions that work. I'd like to say thank you to HCL Tech, our partner who's hosted us here today for this event. HCL Tech is an amazing technology company that connects both people and technology together to leapfrog solutions forward. HCL Tech works in over 60 countries around the world, connecting 222,000 people and investing over 120 million to drive solutions explicitly in India. So on to our conversation. First of all, as we jump into the dialogue, I'd like to emphasize again that gender-based violence is the most widespread and significant and pervasive human rights violation in the world. It touches the lives of too many women and girls worldwide. And yet what we've seen 27 years since the Beijing Platform for Action is actually significant momentum as well as significant awareness of the importance of gender-based violence and the ways in which to address it. We've seen governments come forward with laws and policies. We've seen prevention programming happening across the world. We've seen services delivered to victims of violence. We've seen momentum gathering through social movements like Me Too, as well as Mia Una Menos. And we've seen that awareness growing. And yet we know that that awareness is not enough and more needs to be done because the statistics are actually still quite significant. One in three women still to this day, and this data point has not changed in many, many years, will be subject to physical or sexual violence in her lifetime. One in three women. Furthermore, new data released by UNODC and UN Women just last year showed the prevalence of femicide. And the data is actually quite sobering. More than five women or girls are killed every hour by someone in their family in 2021, really showing the ways in which femicide is reaping significant impacts in women and girls' lives. We do know that preventing and eliminating gender-based violence against women and girls can and must be a priority for governments and partners right around the world. Without its prioritization, we won't see the needle move and we won't see lives protected. Generation equality, as many of you know, is the world's leading effort to really unlock political will, unlock investment, and drive important and accelerated action into critical issues like gender-based violence. Generation equality brings a whole of society approach, bringing the actions of government, civil society, youth, the private sector, and philanthropy, including international organizations together, in order to really scale up the level of ambition, the level of investment, and the level of results into critical issues that matter to women and girls' lives. And so one of the action coalitions for gen generation equality is the Action Coalition on Gender-Based Violence. Through the participation of leaders right across the world, it advanced a very, very ambitious blueprint for action, really positioning the actions of multi-stakeholder partners in order to deliver and accelerate significant results. They have four key actions that are being positioned to drive change in the next five years. Number one, to ratify and implement laws and policies. Number two, to really build up and scale up prevention programming. Number three, to bring an evidence base and ensure that services are scaled for women and girls who are victims of violence right around the world. And number four, and most importantly, to drive investment into women's rights organizations who stand right at the forefront, at the front lines of delivering services for women and girls. 
Today, we are so excited to be joined by an amazing panel and an even more amazing moderator <laughs> who is here to lead our discussion forward. And so with this, I couldn't be more happy than to hand the talking stick over to my colleague, but also my friend, Aldiana Sishic, who is the Chief of Multi-Stakeholder Partnerships at UN Women, and who also comes with a deep experience leading and driving investment and programming in ending violence against women as the former chief of the UN Systems Trust Fund on Violence Against Women. Over to you, Aldiana. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such a generous introduction and also <laughs> giving us the framework in which we are having these discussions today. But as you are excited to have me as a colleague and friend on this stage, I'm absolutely delighted to have four amazing women who I have been working with most of them for mm -hmm. most of my life, for my professional mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to introduce yourselves, if that's okay, so that I'm not misspelling your names or mispronouncing mm -hmm. with my still very strong uh, Bosnian accent. Mm -hmm. So, Michelle, I'll start from you and then we go this way. Good. I'm Michelle Milford Morris. I'm the Vice President for Girls and Women's Strategy at the UN Foundation and so delighted to be here. Thank you. I'm Mariana Savic, Maya Savic, everyone knows me, and uh, uh, I'm director of NGO Athena from Serbia, Belgrade. Hello everyone, I'm Judith Arenas, executive director with APCA Worldwide, and the co-lead of our Gender Center of Excellence. And I'm Françoise Montouté, I'm the CEO of the African Women's Development Fund. Fantastic, thank you so much. And I'm going to start straight into the questions, and I'm going to feed on the fourth point which Sarah has raised because that's the one that is closest to my heart. So I'm going to start with you, Francis, if that's okay with the questions. As Sarah said, the fourth point of action or focus area of action coalition's work is what is the most important, which is where all of our work stands on, on the shoulders of those who have been working so far to achieve gender equality work in general, but also on violence against women. That's a women's movement, yeah? All of those amazing people who are on the front line and who need the resources to do that work, who are actually working with survivors, who are working in education, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not easy, yeah, because resources are very scarce. Excellent. But so please tell me what, as an ex-chief of one fund to the current chief of an amazing fund, what are the current challenges that women's women, mo women's movement is experiencing? So tell us all about it. Huh? Yes, thank you so much uh, for having me, and thanks for this important question. First, I wanted to start by grounding us in realities that are happening right now. Last week, I think on the 12th of uh, January, 50 women were abducted near Abinda in northern Burkina Faso by what people think are jihadist terrorists. 50 women. They were going about their days and they were abducted. If, there's, if we know anything from the recent experiences of uh, recent abductions, we know that they're going to experience very traumatic sexual violence in the next weeks until hopefully they are found. So when we talk about these issues, we're talking about people's, people's lives, people's families, people's mothers, sisters. This is us. This is our sisters. This is, our, this is us. And uh, the way I learned about this, what I was here, is by following African feminist voices uh, from uh, across Francophone Africa, who created this hashtag, hashtag Free Abinda Woman. And I was like, who's behind this? Well, who's behind this is a, a bunch of young African uh, Francophone uh, feminists who, are, who don't have a, a well-funded organization. So they are, doing, they are doing this very important work with no money. That means that their resources are limited. And all of us are thinking, how are we going to help them now? Well, we should have done that before. And there are a few reasons why we haven't. There are some uh, really critical challenges. I'm going to say three. First, there's a huge lack of direct funding to uh, women's rights organizations. There's not lack of money. Money, is, I mean, we, we know this here, OK? Mm -hmm. But the money is not going to the organizations. I think there was data from the OECD that was saying that only 1% of gender-focused money is going to women's rights organizations. Mm -hmm. That means 99% of the money is failing to go to the organizations. I, just let's, see that. let's just say that. So first of all, lack of direct funding. And when that direct funding is available, it's never, or it's very, very rarely, uh, 
operational funding, core funding, flexible funding. We fund people and organizations to operate projects. We don't fund them to sustain, to strengthen their organizations. And what we've learned at AWGF, for example, from the, the COVID-19 crisis, so I joined AWGF in 2020. Chaos, total chaos. We need to move money, we need to move money. And we realized the money we have is, is project funding. Organizations survive, movements thrive, not only on project money, because our lives mm -hmm. are not single issues lives. There's mm -hmm. not a project that will fix my problems, mm -hmm. right? So I think we need to think about the kind of money, not just the amounts. Who we give, how we give, how much we give. And the third one is the lack of intersectional funding. A lot of the funding focuses on one issue. I just met somebody who's in the audience who was telling me about older women. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. we don't think about the most marginalized, women living with disabilities. Mm -hmm. you know, so we don't think about women who are discriminated because of their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. So I think our money that we have, uh, we know it's not a lot, we know it doesn't go where it needs to go, but when it does, it should be intersectional. So for me, those are three big challenges. Thank you so much, Francoise. And you know, my, my old head kicks into this. I immediately want to talk about operational costs and flexible mm -hmm. budgets and what mm -hmm. importance and what straw that is mm -hmm. for the civil society and for women's rights organization in my previous life. Your $20,000 or $10,000 or $5,000 of flexible budget means mm -hmm. billions. And I know, I'm sure Maya will, mm -hmm. will also have something to say about that coming from that. But this really leads me into, into very nicely to ask Michelle some questions, if that's okay yes. with you. Yes. Because um, with the Spotlight Initiative, which is mm -hmm. an initiative of the European Union mm -hmm. uh, with your system, which actually has invested resources exactly into that, into mm -hmm. the civil society and women's organizations. Mm -hmm. But with that, your foundation, your, your organization has created an amazing fund. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that fund? Oh, I'd be delighted. And thank you for hosting the conversation. Thank you for attending the conversation. We don't talk about this enough mm -hmm. in places like this. It's incredibly important. There's no one who's not affected by this issue. So it's just a real privilege to be able to, to give voice to some of these issues. The With Her Fund was created exactly as relief to the challenges that Francois mentioned um, in, in partnership with the glorious and, and incredible Spotlight initiative um, that, that the UN started with the EU. And so it, it, we found it in a moment of intersecting crises and also some big opportunities. And the crises are what you said. There's not enough money going to women's rights organizations. There's not enough money going to ending gender-based violence. And gender-based violence continues unabated, as, as Sarah pointed out to all of us. And then COVID happened. And then we had an, an explosion of domestic violence and all and many forms of gender-based violence. So those are the intersecting crises. The opportunity though is to follow the evidence and the evidence could not be more clear. In countries where autonomous, well-funded women's rights organizations have the resources and support they need, they can change things quickly. In fact, it's the only thing that works. It works more than even having progressive uh, lawmakers in those countries, and we have extraordinary data to prove that. And so we thought, well, there's the answer right there, right? Put flexible resources into the hands of women and get out of their way. And so that is what we, we launched. It's the With Her Fund. We launched it here, actually, in Davos in May, and an event that happened a day after a mass shooting in Texas uh, and the Uvalde uh, school, which is only hours away from my home. And in that moment, uh, we had survivors who told their stories. We had people who run organizations tell their stories. At one point, we couldn't find any of the staff of, our, of the place where we were having this event. And so someone went into the kitchen and found that they were all sobbing there because this resonated so strongly with them, this moment of kind of collective recognition of what a tyranny uh, this is on, on all of our lives. So we started the With Her Fund. We take, uh, we, we work with partners, we work with mostly private sector partners who for a long time have wanted to do something about this, but weren't sure what to do. And then with their support, we are, are right now supporting organizations in Belize, El Salvador, Mali, Malawi, and Trinidad and Tobago. And, and the, our partners at those organizations, they've been doing this work with sweat and ambition for years. And so we have been able to say, here's some money, 
and you know what best to do with it. We're not going to tell you what to do with that money. And so our partner in Argentina is using those funds. Um, uh, they work with deaf and hard of hearing women who've experienced violence and they needed sign language translators and they needed hearing aids. Some of our other partners, they needed to pay rent. Mm -hmm. They needed to pay the accountant who'd been doing the pro bono work for That's years. Sick. And other places they needed to, to fix the motorcycle that was their rescue vehicle. And other places they needed food and shelter. And so it has just been for us, uh, an extraordinarily personal and also because we have lost colleagues to gender-based violence and because we care about it so it's been personal it's our generational equality forum commitment to sustain this fund um, and so uh, we we think that we are doing something that gives us kind of our, our hopes a lot of life and a lot of lift and it's answering those challenges that Francois laid out in such an in such an articulate way and in partnership with the Spotlight Initiative, which is just a, found, a phenomenal partner um, that is a real force for good uh, against gender-based violence around the world. Thank you so much, Michelle. And you know, I really like what you said about get out of the way. Yeah. 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 Because we, we really, I mean, I've, I've in, in a role with the trust fund, I've traveled and visited our grantees. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, as it happens, and I didn't know this, this is really a coincidence, my as organization is, was one of the grantees of the trust fund. When you go and see what people are doing on the ground, you just think, yeah. what am I doing here? Like, right. get out of the way. Yeah. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, during the COVID, you both ma man mentioned challenges. Would you say, who am I to tell them you, will, you cannot buy the mobile phones? Because yeah. that's the only way yeah. that you're going to reach now the woman who's yeah. experienced violence in, in her that's home. That's right. So moving then swiftly to Maya to tell us a little bit about uh, your project and that work that you are doing on the ground, actually because your work is focused, I would say, just a little bit, because I, I visited and, uh, and amazing. It's not just about supporting survivors of trafficking, but it's also providing that next stage, which is economic empowerment. So I'm going to stop there and hand over to you to, okay, to tell you. a little bit more about it. Uh, thank you, Yon Vimy, to bring uh, the, the broad uh, gender to Davos. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. and this amazing uh, like, um, and priori prioritization of elimination of violence against women and girls. So this is like something that is very important for, for everyone, especially from fe feminist organization. So yes, uh, while uh, we all know that elimination of violence against women and girls is uh, and supporting someone who survived violence is not a single intervention, mm -hmm. it is a process. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is why it is important to have operational grants. Mm -hmm. It is like, it, we are not talking about months, we are talking about years That's right. when someone exactly. is needs support. Yeah. You know. And we live in the era that uh, uh, practically uh, violence against uh, women and girls is replicated throughout to new spaces, like right. cyberspaces. Yes. And the conference brought, again, the same amount of violence against women uh, all around the world. And we need, well, we are moving in snail pace. And I think that we should be jaguars. <laughs> you know? So this is like something that, <laughs> um, uh, and uh, well, about the operational grants. So we work with women and girls who survived violence and refugee women and girls mm -hmm. for 20 years. And we were always in trouble with, with funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So eight years ago, uh, we uh, uh, decided to open our own revenue stream, open a social enterprise that produced bagels in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was like... Uh, Which are very really tasty, by the way. Very <laughs> <laughs> tasty. It's very also tasty. a tasty catering, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then then uh, we managed to like... Uh, create, recreate our own recipe of bagel, mm -hmm. like downloaded all the mm -hmm. recipes and together with women who were there in our safe houses in our programs, we made the delicious bagels that are like with the, with the, with the spice of uh, like fight for dignity. They are very Ooh, special. Yes. You know it's and a lunch hour here now. Yeah, yeah I know, we're getting hungry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and um, it gave us strength, actually. It gave yeah. us our own revenue, our own money mm -hmm. to fund our activities and to deploy this uh, revenue whenever we need it. And then it gave us, like, it, it uh, covered this missing link that was always, uh, we are not thinking about that. This is uh, like economic justice for women mm -hmm. that were in our programs. And we started to organize trainings for them. We started to connect with private companies. We started to connect with national employment services. We started <coughs> to uh, develop this model. And now we are going to uh, develop this uh, uh, Women Economic uh, Justice Collaborative that will be amazing hub 
for all the women who Fantastic. want to work in the food industry. So uh, with the support of UN Women, actually, during COVID, we managed to obtain these training services for women, for a refugee and, and women, because you gave us like uh, uh, also uh, uh, funds that we had from UNTF that we could uh, deploy whenever we uh, mm -hmm. uh, thought that it is useful. And it was like the right moment for, for women to get uh, this uh, uh, opportunity to, to get training. And I think that what I would uh, like to see is uh, from the donors and from stakeholders to be bold yeah. and to use the power of words to confront also lousy governments and mm -hmm. to uh, stand side by side with women's organization. And uh, uh, I would like to see uh, more uh, investment in partnership that are like built uh, in solidarity and an empathic uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. And also uh, to uh, fund this women's organization that really support at least this trustful uh, and trust the women's agency yeah and to uh, and also uh, don't question uh, women's decision so yes. this is like something that i would like to see in the future that's fantastic thank you so maya and you know i remember that time at the covid when we were all going into the lockdowns and then these huge questions about what mm -hmm. happens now to women who are survivors of violence because women they have no escape route yeah. how do you reach them what how do you provide them with what they actually need mm -hmm. and that decision that the, you know the operational costs now need to be completely reconsidered right. and actually allow organizations to use the funds where they see it fit because who am I to say really? from where I'm sitting what mm -hmm. the woman needs in right. any country around the world so but you know you mentioned uh, all the communications and the digitalization of the world and we have an expert here as yeah. well on in that world <laughs> which is Judith who uh, I know for like I won't even say because that will do, that will reveal how no. old I am. No, that's <laughs> not going to happen. That's not happening. Uh, I hope they will cut that out. Um, so Judith, you work for Upco. Maybe you tell us just what Upco is because we know, but just so the people understand, it's it, it's kind of the, the scope. And then you know what I'm really I'm going completely off the script now. So sorry about surprise, but no, 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 but no. Uh, you know. <laughs> I've heard a lot about digitalization here in Davos. Uh, and a lot has been talked about it on the streets and uh, in conferences and meetings. But I'm not hearing, you know, how that relates to gender equality, how that relates to women, how that relates to violence against women. Mm -hmm. We know that digitalization and technology have created amazing opportunities. I mean, look what we are able yeah. to do today, yeah? to speak right. about the issue thanks to techno firm, mm -hmm. to share Davos with people who actually cannot be here. So mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our goal here. But at the same time, technology has created so many challenges, particularly yeah. for women and girls. So that context, kind of, can you take and tell us from yourself, because I know how much APCO does uh, in terms of good work there, and also you are a commitment maker for generation equality yeah. exactly on that. So please, go ahead. Thank you, and again, as others have said, thank you to UN Women for really, not just bringing gender mm -hmm. to Davos and making sure that it's front and center of the agenda, but putting in a, what is primarily a business environment, the really important topic of gender-based violence. I, APCO Worldwide is a global consulting company. We provide professional services across government, public sector, private sector entities. I have the pleasure of leading our Gender Center of Excellence. Why? Because gender is an issue that, unlike others, impacts you within an organization and outside an organization. It isn't just about the counsel that we give to our clients, but it's also about the policies that we have to take and reflect upon them. And as someone who has spoken to the C-suite, spoken to a number of companies that are very interested on the issue of gender equality, frankly, very, very few of them want to talk about gender-based violence. And you know, I want to call out those that are willing to recognize that gender-based violence plays a huge economic toll it stops economic prosperity. It's a public health issue, and not also, you know, just impacts your overall company well-being. And I think, you know, as, as Michelle has already mentioned, this is an issue that, you know, you talked about a lot of situations that we've seen worsening and, and the growing pressure and crisis. 
and the concern that we all have about the worsening and the regression on women's rights. I think we do need to call out that the ongoing conflict in Ukraine is mm -hmm. also a situation because as someone that worked on the Balkans many years ago, I never thought I would get to read again mm -hmm. about the use of sexual violence as a weapon of war. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that is so egregious that as companies are willing to take a stand on situations, it also impacts you. You've got to look across the, look across the board. Um, but it really is an issue that, you know, from the battlefield to the bedroom, we've seen online, you, we've seen violence grow online. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think as a, a generation equality commitment maker, APCO has actually st stepped into the technology side, really because we wanted to be helpful to figure out where are these new frontiers going? And our commitment is to support the work of the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and really make sure that the amazing work that she's doing as the first ever <laughs> female to hold that really important position gets the dissemination and the support, which is multi-stakeholder in the same spirit as generation equality, but how we address this into these new frontiers. Technology is amazing. We're being hosted by a company that is showing us the power of good of technology. And we know that during the pandemic, technology was a critical tool in terms of making mm -hmm. sure that women and girls who were caught in situations of violence had support, were able to know their rights, and were able to figure out solutions to some of those issues. We know that as we talked about how legal transformation is one of the priorities, legal transformation only goes a certain way unless you mm -hmm. have empowerment to go with it. Mm -hmm. right. And technology is one of those great facilitators of empowerment, not just across prevention of violence, but also across driving economic progress. Mm -hmm. So within this, we love technology. It's fantastic. It's amplified things. It's allowed women to go out into work. It's allowed women to become entrepreneurs, to drive capital, to change the world. But it comes as a heavy, heavy cost. And I think I do want to thank Athena and Maya for being part of the civil society groups that have provided input into the special rapporteurs Groundbreaking, groundbreaking work on online violence and the gendered approach and the gendered perspective of violence. And I think that applies across all of the issues mm -hmm. that we're seeing. And it, but it has a, a deeper impact than the actual violence. It has that notion of when you attack women, especially prominent women, be they politicians, be they journalists, be they activists, mm -hmm be they business leaders, and you're attacking them because of their gender mm -hmm. and because of values that are close to them, it has a chilling effect. Mm -hmm. It basically means that a lot of women, and women who could be doing even more amazing things, are having to consider, do they keep an online presence? Yeah. Do they yeah. keep access to technology? Mm -hmm. Or do they just shut it down? Because mm -hmm. physical violence is huge. It has a terrible impact. Online violence is amplified, mm -hmm. and it's also anonymous, yeah. and it's vicious, mm -hmm. and it comes with a lot of implications. And scarily enough, online hate mm. translates into real yes. life Heretics. violence. Heretics. 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 And we haven't understood the, dimens the dimensions and all the impacts. So I think we are really committed to working with a number of technology partners in terms of uncovering these joint solutions, which mm -hmm. have to be multi-stakeholder. Uh, but also bearing in mind that shutting off access is not the answer. Very often, a lot of times, we'll say, well, well you're getting attacked online, just switch off your Twitter yeah. account. Yeah. 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 That's fantastic, you're a journalist, you depend on that account <laughs> yeah. to be able to drive and do your job. Don't have a mobile phone. What about when yeah. you need it because you do your banking through it? <laughs> so I think it's... It's a, it's a growing and ever-present challenge, but it also requires, I think in the spirit of this conversation, mm -hmm. joint solutions uh, being Absolutely. designed, including with those that are actually the experts in coming up with technology. Don't ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, right. And you just kind of led exactly where I wanted to kind of point the point of joint solutions. I think that's the key. I mean, uh, as Sarah in her kind introduction says, I lead the multi-stakeholder partnership mm -hmm. section in UN Women and all of our work is about partnership, is about particularly private sector philanthropy and, and, and public. 
And I think just being here in Davos, and I wanted to kind of bring us back to the reality where we are in a very privileged space. Mm -hmm. You know, just walking that, this is my second Davos, mm -hmm. and I come from working very heavily, heavily with civil society. So you can imagine I have a little bit of, um, girl, what's going on here? Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you know, at, at, the same, at the same breath, I will say I have met amazing business leaders yes. before yeah. I came to Davos and here who are there ready and really want to work to change, to give that, to, to, to develop the really business in a way that it yep. should be. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of like, yeah, let, let's go. Let's roll up the sleeves and let's go. Right. So I'm like here today, but I'm already thinking next Davos. Yeah? So what is missing this year? Like we brought the Gender yep. Equality Hub. We are mm -hmm. not going anywhere. We are staying mm -hmm. there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We will be back next year. What's what are we thinking now mm -hmm. that we are missing? I know for sure what I've seen yesterday, for example, in our He For She event, I have seen more men than I have ever seen in, in events actually on mm -hmm. issue of gender equality, mm -hmm. which I thought, oh my mm -hmm. God, this is, seems like it's moving, yeah? Right. So that's the barrier we know we need to cross, yeah? But mm -hmm. what are the barriers with private sector that we need to cross and bring forward yeah. in the next mm -hmm. year, mm -hmm. the next yeah. that was, is even better or much more better when mm -hmm. it comes to gender equality, when it comes to violence against women. Mm -hmm. I will start with you, then Judith, then Maya, and then Michelle, and then we will wrap it up. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, what I want to share is that the invitation I made earlier, which is fund directly, fund better, fund more, can be a bit daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have the resources, but you don't have the expertise or you don't have the access to movements, as the cool kids say, this is where women's funds enter the chat. Okay, mm -hmm. we already have mm -hmm. those feminist funds, women's funds all across the, uh, the global south that are led by African or global south feminists and no, are coming from movements, not the experiences. So when we say, for example, we need um, flexible funding, it's because we know that in our movement we have women who lead organizations who have done a lot of it um, voluntarily and to, they haven't paid anything towards their pension. So they don't dare to retire. Mm -hmm. And then right. we mm -hmm. tell them, your governance is crap because you're not retiring. Mm -hmm. But if you're outside of movements, you don't see this. The beauty of feminist funds, of women's funds, is that we have that, not just the understanding, but the experience. And we adapt sure, yeah. our grant making and our partnership mm -hmm. ways in a way that we absorb the shock of the restrictions and that we provide that. So please, you know, do not try and make up something else. Do not try and force INGOs right. or mm -hmm. international organizations to yeah. make up new things. The mechanisms exist. They're called women's funds or feminist funds. Very open. So what is missing for me is creating the link between women's and feminist funds and the private sector, individual philanthropies. It's a very tenuous link, and I'm very excited about the possibility of that partnership. Mm -hmm. So, action point. Yes. How about next year, you and I, and anybody else who wants to join, mm -hmm. organize a session with feminist funds and the private sector to give them a bit of training. Amen. Let's do it. <laughs> so a couple of points. I think um, one point is diversity, and I want to specifically focus on age diversity. I think, you know, Davos is a place where senior executives come but you don't have senior executives without a pipeline and you mm. can't expect people to understand issues mm -hmm. unless you give exposure. So I would love to see younger voices and diverse voices in the conversation. We also have to recognize that particularly when it comes to gender, we're seeing a lot more young feminists who are not inside organizations. How do we help build those spaces where they can come and they can tell us what is really making a difference? So first of all is I want younger people. Second of all, I would love us to be able to build a greater understanding of language, particularly when it comes to GBV. I think there's a reticence from the private sector. It's a scary, negative space. Let's come up to, from, a, from a space of building. How can we build mm -hmm. for, for better? Mm -hmm. And that has to be done jointly. So I'm a communicator. Yes, I want to work yes, with yeah. you on that. <laughs> and then I would say that there is also a point about I'm a great believer in the carrot and not the stick. 
So how do we create a conversation where we actually showcase, you know, Sarah gave us yeah. an introduction of what HCL Technologies exactly. is doing. How do we value and recognize those that are really leading in the field? How do we create spaces where we also recognize this is a process? We don't have the solutions, we're building together. How do we recognize that it's going to be a journey and how do we all come together on that? So, and we have some great examples like Absolutely. Patagonia, for example, who, yes. is, who is really, you know, leading in, in this. Yes. But action point two, how about and the generation equality banner because you're a commitment maker are, right? next year in davos we organize a session another session because that's what davos is about <laughs> with young youth families apco and generation equality mm -hmm. and we organize and we bring young families mm, young men and women yes and bring private sector to be good with youth and our, our one of our other commitments, because we don't have just one, is actually to support young voices and young oh, feminists wonderful. in the climate space. And so we have we'll young bring those along. And we have all you yep. to uh, presence in the generation. Absolutely. Politics. Action point two. Maya. Thank you. taking note. <laughs> <laughs> this is being filmed. <laughs> We're on the record. <laughs> this is your, your record. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, it is like... Um, uh, I would quote you, and uh, not another survey, but... Uh, to uh, like, uh, uh, we already know a lot, we learned a lot, and to scale that up. Uh, the thing is that with businesses, I would like to see, like, uh, like we have environmental matrix, ECG, mm. I would like to see gender less, uh, less investing mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. within the company and, uh, and, uh, and going through it, through the companies. And, uh, and also I would like to see more funds to women-led initiatives, like social enterprises that are led with women. And I would agree with you, more youth and the more uh, 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 grassroots NGOs yes. yeah. that yes. are talking from the, from the field, from their countries, from their experience. And that is something that I would you know, like vote for. So, so we, are, we are going to do that next year then? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what I have not seen or heard here yet is the voice of survivors. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of businesses talking about good things as well, right? But I want those businesses to bring these who those women who have the help through that uh, in terms of support. Yeah. So let's have some some of those agents, amazing agents of change, next year here in Davos and get businesses mm -hmm. to sponsor them to come and tell this. Absolutely, story. Yeah. we have this advocacy uh, yes. group of refugee women, so that is like a great great idea. Action and point three. Yes. We will work on that. As a parent has said, I think building on what Michelle has said, I think some of the best uh, policies that we see within companies to support survivors actually come from those companies where yes. sadly they have been impacted right. and they have suffered from violence. So mm -hmm. let's also build mm -hmm. on those who have had to learn just from, from tragic circumstances. Absolutely and right. for your point, just sorry Michelle, just before I go, I want to just highlight one thing. Our work with private sector, at least from your own point, is not just about private sector working outside externally, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's also private sector changing itself. Exactly. Because let's not forget exactly. private it's sector. internal. Internal, uh, internal work on, or on the gender equality, yeah. on violence, on sexual harassment, etc., mm -hmm. etc. So that is something that I want to see those stepping out and saying we have you know when we do the due diligence for example you have companies that comes up says they have a 15 cases of sexual harassment in their company mm -hmm. and then you have a company that comes up and says there is no sexual harassment cases whatsoever mm -hmm. so l false logic leads you to think mm -hmm. that the company that has no sexual harassment is a good company as opposed to company that maybe right has policies and practices mm -hmm. in place that have enabled women to report on exactly. sexual harassment and then right. potentially has a, uh, mm -hmm. systems in place that can deal with that yeah right so there's a mix there are some mixed messages as well right. that we need to bring in the forefront of our discussions to say what does it what do you need to have as a company to deal with the issue of sexual harassment of mm -hmm. sexual violence that happens in your company mm -hmm. now Michelle yes your foundation is your foundation <laughs> and it does so many different things and so many amazing things Thank you. Uh, and you know the, with her fund is uh, uh, any work very closely with civil society yes and, we do uh, you with her fund is a really amazing fund and I know it started with this very small That's but right. mighty yep. uh, project. What do you want to see well, next year here in Davos? I catch on quick, so I know I need some action items. So I have one that's ready to go, and then I got a high ambition one. But I wanted to underline this point 
companies learn from personal experience. Like there's a telecommunications company, Liberty Latin America. They lost two employees mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And from that, they crafted the most ambitious and beautiful and compassionate um, a policy for their employees to help them and, and to do something about this. And so I think companies can learn from experience, but we don't want them to have to have that experience. Exactly. Learn, right. Exactly. So here's the, the ready, the, the action item that's ready to go. I mean, to your point, it, during the UN General Assembly in September, I participated in a conversation hosted by Estee Lauder and Co-Impact that was about exactly this. At creating a, creating a conduit between private sector funders and feminist funds and helping private sector uh, donors learn from each other about what is trust-based yep. philanthropy. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Why should you be giving multi-year grants? Yep. And all of those things. And so Co-Impact and, and the UN Foundation, we're going to continue that work and create and, and strengthen um, that connection so that the private sector, can they can work, blend their funds, they can learn from each other, and that we can increase the amount of money that is going to, to, to the women's, to women's movements and feminist funds. So let's keep doing that and let's do that here. Let's do that everywhere and all the time, but let's do that here. But here's the second one. I want this on the main stage in the Congress Center. Yeah. Judith made the point beautifully. This is, a, set aside the most important point, which is the egregious violations of human rights, that is gender-based violence and what it does to real girls and women and all their diversity all over the world. Underneath that is extraordinary costs, extraordinary public health costs, cost to courts, cost to policers, cost in, in, in public health systems of all kinds, huge cost to the private sector and the well-being of their employees and the readiness of their workforce. This is a business issue. This is a public policy issue in addition to being a human rights issue. And we don't have to accept it being this way. No. Why do we think violence is inevitable? Why do we think it's cultural and personal and intractable? It's not inevitable and we don't have to accept that. And I am thrilled that they have a session on care inside the Congress Center. But for, for my money, there's almost nothing more important than this. Half of our human family is, ex is always under the threat of this horrible human rights violation. And I think that we should hold our ambition to making sure that it's on that stage. So, to conclude this, <laughs> I'm employee of the United Nations. Yes, I work for you. I would not be a good employee if I wouldn't set up a task force. Uh, what <laughs> <laughs> so, what a great so group. we here have a task force already, task force, yeah. a working group. We can uh, we can debate on how we want to call it. Mm -hmm. That will work on mm -hmm. ensuring that violence against women gets on the stage next year in Davos. Let's do it in the Congress. Let's do it. Thank you to everybody who has been here. Thank you so much, thank you so much, thank you so much. And uh, now I don't know what I'm supposed to say. So You're supposed to thank us. those people <laughs> joining us from oh, our oh, So we have to do cut three now here. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. You're rolling, you will edit me, I know. So okay. anyway, thank you so much everybody. Thank you everybody who joined us online. Uh, we will be following up on this action. We yes. set up the task force and trust me with these Girls on, on a platform, it will happen. <laughs> and in support of amazing civil society organizations, women that actually I am standing on their shoulders, you are, we are all standing yeah, on yes. their shoulders yeah. of what they've yes. fought so far and achieved not just on violence against women, but on gender based, on, on violence against women, gender equality in general. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll see you next year. Bye. Bye.